basic reminder of what we were doing and then see how it's all going and um, which is going to be much more of a general discussion and I read a few bits of um, feedback things people have been writing about the selection toolkit so I thought I would start with reminding us about why we have one in the first place very briefly so very briefly way back way back in 2011 the Southport group reported um, archaeology stores were full to capacity and then we went on to 2012 and fame saying that there were 9,000 boxes of archives that didn't have homes and in 2013 the Edwards report came out and um, said that you know we'd lost a third of our archaeology staff in museums and then in 2016 the first of the SMA surveys came out which said that you know 23% of museums were closed to archives and that 63% were going to run out of space in five years. I'd like to point out we are now past that point of five years. The subsequent um, reports the next two basically continued on the same thing just saying things were slowly getting worse and obviously we're waiting for the fourth iteration of that I would like to think things have improved but I would be surprised if it's a really rosy report so all of these things together the conclusion was we need to be really careful about where we are putting in store for long-term curation perpetuity be choosy about what we're putting in and be really clear about why we're putting them in there so like kind of justifying our choices and our reasoning because um, otherwise we're going to start losing stuff so at subsequent meetings and projects there were calls national calls for guidance on how to do this how to be choosy how to select so for example at the 21st century challenges in archaeology there was a big forum a big archives um, get together and they basically one of the things they called for was unified core guidance endorsed by all the regular people um, on selection and deposition and at the Mendoza review which Duncan's already mentioned they asked um, to improve the long-term store long-term sustainability of the archaeological archives generated by developer funded excavations we needed work to see how that could be done so after all of those calls HE funded the creation of the selection toolkit the selection toolkit is a tool to aid in the creation of selection strategies. And I think we came up with a definition of what a selection strategy is. So it's it, the selection strategy details the project specific selection process agreed by all stakeholders, which will be applied to the working project archive prior to transfer into curatorial care. It was created by a working group that was represented by all the major players in the sector, you know, the SMA, CIFA, Algeo, all that kind of thing. And it was based on existing best practice, the best practice that we all generally as CIFA members um, or members of other institutions or just practitioners in this sector who want to morally do the right job and uphold their ethics want to abide by. And so, for example, the CIFA um, standards and guidance on best practice of archaeological archiving um, says you have to produce stable, or die, stable and ordered archive to recognise standards. And the recognised standards are things like the AAF standards, the European standards and um, the ADS standards. And for example, the European standards says standards and procedures for the creation, selection, management, compilation and transfer of the archive must be agreed and documented in the design of every archaeological project and be understood by all project personnel. So the point was we were all theoretically saying in all IWSIs, and all our project briefs and all our project designs we are doing this but we weren't always <sighs> some people weren't doing it at all to be perfectly honest some people were doing it and maybe not document it and there was a bit of a mismatch and it was how do we record it how do we go about it so um, we created the selection toolkit to give people the tools to do this and as I said quite a lot of the units out there were already doing this they were already in doing selection they were imposing project specific selection strategies it was already happening maybe what wasn't happening so much was the recording and the understanding between the units and the specialists and the museum of what all those processes were how they worked together and so it was recorded in the archive so we knew and conversely some people weren't doing it at all so we we're getting quite a mismatch of what was ending up in museum stores we included a template in the selection toolkit a template as in if you want to use this you can we were very clear on that it's not the only way to record your selection strategy make it project specific match your project there are things you can do I think we've already heard some discussions about people having quite generic 
um, selection policies which they can refer to in WSIs and say, however, we know that at this point we are going to do this YZ, we're going to reassess this aspect of it. So, you know, there are ways that you can come about this. You can look at, I think we've already heard about um, type specific approaches, as approaches to different either types of sites, different types of materials. You know, so there are ways around this that mean you don't have to write everything from scratch from the very beginning. I think we need to be quite clear on that. Um, but I think the key is to record what we're doing, because one of the big issues we had when you look at it from the museum end is they would read a report that said XYZ was found and then they'd open the boxes and there was only a small fraction of that in the boxes and that's fine if you followed your selection strategy and there's a reason for that and your specialist has told you why but if you haven't actually put that reason in in the box or in the paperwork or told the museum what they're like, are they missing it why, why isn't it there was it lost is it somewhere else in the museum have they not had it deposited yet it's, you know what I mean it's that kind of thing why have you kept that bit and why you haven't? So the, I think the key is basically recording, recording it. Um, the BDI amongst you might have noticed that we've recently added a new page, and I think it was mentioned um, earlier. Now, the new page is Archaeological Archives from Sterile Projects. Now, the reason this came about is because for a few years we've been hearing discussions and it's been raised by various practitioners that these words are starting to be bandied about. Some of it has come through from... Um, that idea of digital archives and the cost of deposition but also about us being more selective and words were starting to be used to describe archives that people were calling I know negative site archives which is a bit weird because how can an archive be negative it physically it is an archive it exists um, a blank site a negative site um, an ins insignificant remains who, who's deciding what they are so it was all these terms were being bandied about and used and um, no one kind of really defining them properly. We also had a bit of variation in how um, repositories were applying these terms or trying to deal with this issue, this issue. And quite frankly, you kind of understand the point if they open boxes and boxes of paperwork that says this was a boring site, we didn't find any archaeology, then they think, well, why have I got 10 boxes in a, uh, you know, of, of paperwork that says that? Um, and so we had a couple of different types of variation in the way it was applied. Like one, for example, requires um, only a single page report to deposit a blank site and then says what a blank site is um, on a site on which investigation reveals no archaeological record. And another one said that um, an oasis record might be OK to preserve accu accurately the record of a site with a negative archaeological result. So people were trying to deal with this, but it was all a bit varied. And we just decided that we needed kind of one terminology one definition and one way of dealing with it that people could refer to and then discuss and then um, deal with within each project so um archaeological archives from sterile projects so we said a sterile pro archaeological project is one that produces nothing of evidential value evidential value derives from the potential of a place to yield evidence about past human activity now this comes from um work that is used all the time within the planning sector about how they identify planning needs, put conditions on sites. This evidential value, is, evidential value is used throughout that. And it was the best term the committee for the project came up with. Once again, the committee was made up of all the normal players in the sector. Um, so for an example of um, a site that um, uh, has nothing of evidential value, it might be a site that's been completely truncated to the natural due to recent development or trenching that records nothing beyond topsoil and subsoil. Now, this was sent out, this uh, definition, I think it's been tweaked ever so slightly since um, the consultation. We came up with a definition as a committee, um, workshopped it a bit, sent it out to the people we know and discussed it, and then it all went out to consultation. I would say that this tiny project, which was quite small for this one page on the toolkit, had a, the best consultation response I have ever had. <laughs> from any project I've worked on. I, it took me so long to work through all the consultation reports and I ended up having to code them as in, are they being, do they like that bit? Which, which bit don't they like? And it, they just want a word change, but generally they're happy. Oh, they're really not happy. Um, you know, and I ended up, and in general, most people, it, it turned out, were quite happy. They might not like the word, but that's probably because they'd already been using a different word, but they didn't really care, to be perfectly honest. And I think our point was, which was why we added, added a sentence on the website, was we've used this term sterile because we think it works best, but if you want to call it something else, you can. 
just kind of use the same definition and follow the same process. Now, we did have some people who um, clearly were not aware of the entire selection toolkit or the discussion in archaeological archives for the past 10 years because they wanted me to look at selection of the whole archiving process, not just blank sites. And I thought, OK, and I did kind of respond to them and gear them towards all the existing data that was already out there. We also had, a, there were a few, there was only a couple. We had a couple of responses that were very much, um, you shouldn't throw anything away, you're bad people, we should retain everything. I don't know how to respond to that, <laughs> so I kind of ignored them and hoped they went away, which I know is really bad, but I don't, I don't, there comes a point where I'm like, do you not see the situation we're in? Everyone else does. Um, we did have um, a couple of responses, and I am talking a couple out of a very large number that said we were asking for too much. And when I go into the next bit, you'll see why I, I think that's weird that they thought we were saying they needed to do too much work. Um, the reason it's in the selection toolkit is because it's all part of the selection process. You don't start any project with the assumption that it's going to be sterile. Every project is started in the assumption that you're going to find something of evidential value, which means that your WSI should include all the usual suspects, such as you know your um, data management plan and your outline selection strategy. Um, obviously, as you work through the project, some of these aspects are going to be reduced to a certain um, amount. Um, oh, I've got to him. Yeah, so you know, you can some of these, some of the normal things you would do, you're not going to do as much. Um, so obviously, the end result we are also assuming is going to be a much pared down version of your average um, archive. By definition, it's going to be documentary only. You found no evidence, evidential. You found nothing. It's documentary only. That's a given. Um, and you're going to have certain types of material in your working archive from a sterile project. So you're going to have, still have things like a brief, a WSI, um, your data management plan, descriptive data, um, spatial data, drawings, all these kind of things that you're going to still have within your working project archive because it's still a project you've done. And it just needs to go through the normal selection process. Does it need to be included or not? And we suggest that all of this could be included, once you've gone through your selection process of what should be included, in a single digital document, which therefore becomes the preserved archive. One document, that's it. You could put it all in as appendices or follow it through. And therefore, this single digital document could be preserved in the UK very easily through the OASIS system as a means of submitting it for long-term curation, which, as we all know, isn't going to cost you anything, that single digital document, which is why I was very surprised about the responses that suggested we were telling people to do too much work. Because I thought, but I'm asking you to produce one document and deposit it through, aid, through um, Oasis. Obviously, in uh, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, there'd be another route for that. Um, there are some provisos. Repositories might turn around and say, oh, but you, you wrote some context sheets. You say, well, I've, repeat, you know, I've digitised all those context sheets and reproduced them at the end of my PDF, and they say, oh, but we still want them. If they want them, they want them, but I would say, seeing as we currently have guidelines, that's their choice to take them, and they can take them, but I would say they shouldn't be charging you for that would be, would be my recommendation. So that was a very quick whiz through. Um, I know someone mentioned earlier about other types of selection of sites where they might not be sterile, but the finds might be insignificant, or we might have gone through selection. Maybe this end product might be suitable for other types of projects where you have found something of evidential value, but you've gone through your entire selection process and all your specialists have gone, all oh, these three bits of cruddy medieval pottery that have been bouncing around on this field for hundreds and hundreds of years. Sorry, Duncan, it's always medieval, but some of them are crud. Um, you know, we've reported them, we've said what they are, we've got it all, the data exists in the file. No, you don't need to keep those three bits. So you still might end up with this as an end product but that's a normal selection process that I would say because you have found something of evidence.